Joshua chapter 1, if you would. Joshua chapter 1. I don't know about you, but this series has been extremely helpful for me, and I'm grateful for it. I trust it has for you. And let me encourage you to pass it on to others. Uh, People are hurting and struggling in their homes. I've heard testimony of people that sat in their car when they got home from work, trying to get the courage up to go in because their home is a battlefield. Instead of a place of peace, a place, a little piece of heaven on earth. That ought not be the case for Christian people. It ought to be a place of a haven. A place where they be around God's people. People that pray with them. People they, that they pray with. And, and uh, people they can, that encourage one another. And all that type of thing. And may God help us. That's what God wants for your home. And that's what, as parents, we have the privilege to make it that way. Now, we all have a part to play. I'm just praying with my daughters that God would help each of us. But just as much as I have a part to play and Mama has a part to play, Caitlin, Christian, and Chloe all have a part to play. And uh, you can have a right home and a child still choose, I'm going to do wrong. And uh, boy, it can be a, such a hurt in a home. But what a joy when they see the example of, uh, of the father and mother and then follow in that pattern. And may God help us. Joshua chapter 1, here was a man of God. Joshua, I love Joshua. As a kid, you know, I thought, man, I wish I was named Joshua. I like Caleb, too, man. Both of them were great. David was great. Uh, Gary's not in the Bible, unfortunately, but uh, it's still fine. I'm, I'm named after my uncle, which is, he's a great uh, man, a testimony of a godly man. Raised, God, raised godly children. Praise God for that. Just like my dad, all five of his children are in full-time Christian work and uh, still married to the person they got married originally to. And they're all their kids and family are in church and just... A wonderful testimony, so I'm grateful for that heritage of my Uncle Gary, too. But uh, Joshua and Caleb, man, uh, what men, you know, and you see Joshua there leading uh, the battle and and just love Joshua. But Joshua wasn't just a man at work. You know, sometimes we get in our world, the man, you know, we just heard sung about is, you know, he drives a big truck that's jacked up and and he likes football and and, and beer, you know, and that's cool. That's That's a tough man. But that's not what Joshua was. Joshua did work at home. Joshua led them to God at home. Even on his last day, he's still preaching that message. You read read the end of Joshua 23. He says, this day I go the way of all the earth. And yet he's still saying, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And what a blessing to have a a man like that. And may God help us to to desire to be men like this. Notice what it says in Joshua 1, verse 8 and 9. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Say, what was the secret to Joshua being this man? We're going to read it right here. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do, according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. Why? For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Our New Testament version of this, in my opinion, is the Philippians chapter, uh, uh, chapter 4 and verse 5, 6, 7, and 8 there. Uh, what does it say? Often we quote that verse, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your heart and mind by Christ Jesus. But the key to all that is the verse before that, verse 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. He said moderation. Yeah. You know, someone says eat in moderation. You know. Uh, people talk about um, having moderation in different areas. That's, that's same, exactly what you think is what it's talking about. A Christian ought to be someone that's stable. You know, when at work there's announcement that there are going to be layoffs, the Christian's, oh no, I can't lose this job. I can't lose this job. A Christian's not that way. You know what a Christian's like? My God provided for me before this job. He's used this job to provide for me, but God's the one that provided for me. And he'll provide for me after that. You say, how can you have moderation like that in a situation like this? The Lord's at hand. That just means it's right here. You know, my Bible's at hand. See, I can reach it. It's right here. It's just like you like the remote when you sit down. It's, it's at hand. I can reach it. Like your drink, your iced tea, your sweet tea at hand, right? Where you can reach it. The Lord's at hand. He's right here. Hey, 
so therefore be careful for nothing. <laughs> you know, when I'd walk through the woods and get late at night, I wouldn't get scared if I was with my dad. I wasn't scared. My dad's here. Now, if I was by myself, I'd have been scared. I'd heard every twig break, and I'd think, you know, some squirrel. You know, squirrels are the loudest things in the woods, you know. But you'd think it's some big coyote or something to get you. Uh, up in the north, we had wolves, you know. And, uh, but my dad, I was fine. Well, same with this. Hey, the Lord's right here. You know, Jesus in the boat. Uh, Jesus said, why are you all afraid? I'm in the boat. You don't have to worry. Let the hurricane Ida come. God's in the boat. You don't have to worry about it. He's in the boat. And so what a blessing. I'm not saying to be foolish, you know, or that type of thing. I'm just saying, if he's at hand, we don't have to run around like a chicken with our head cut off. We don't have to be pulling our hair. Oh, no, what am I going to do? The world's that way, but you're, why, how are you not scared about it? Didn't you hear what they said? Yeah, but my God, he supplies my needs. I'm continuing to seek him first, and he's committed himself But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things should be added unto you. Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to still keep being faithful to church. I'm going to keep reading my Bible and praying. And if this job ends, if this business closes, God's going to open another one. He's going to meet our needs. That's my God. And see, that's what he's saying here. Hey, this book of the law should not depart thy mouth. I honestly believe we would make more out of verse 8 if we believe verse 9. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. He's right here. And when you get up in the morning and you decide whether you're going to read the Bible or look in your phone... Check out what's going on in the news. Or you decide you're going to spend time in the Lord in prayer and Bible reading or whatever you like to do. Boy, if, if I remember the Lord is, thy God's with thee, well, Lord, I'm going to enjoy your time and presence with you. But look what he says, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. It's interesting that word meditate. Our word go, world uh, thinking goes to a yoga position or something or, you know, om type of meditation. But honestly, in my Bible, I've circled the word meditate and the word mouth. And really, there's a connection there. Uh, meditate off, has the idea, it can, can, it has an idea of memorization, that it's in your heart, but it also has an idea of muttering. You know people that mutter themselves. They're trying to tell themselves what to do on this. Okay, righty tidy, lefty loosey. They're working on something, you know, and they're, and they're muttering. The idea is here, this book of the law shall not depart of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate. That, that verse that spoke to you this morning, you're reminding yourself of. You're, you're meditating on. Boy, I was, I've been meditating this week on Isaiah 52, 10 that I read. You know, it took God, just his word to create the world. So the Bible talks about him using his fingers some. But the Bible says in Isaiah 52, 10 that he bore his holy arm to give salvation to the ends of the earth. God brought out the big gun, so to speak. He bore his holy arm to bring salvation. Creation just took his word. With his fingers, he made out the oceans maybe a little bit, but he bore his holy arm for salvation. Think how much God gave and God put forth for us for salvation. And so just to mutter that to yourself, to meditate on it. Uh, The book of the law shall not depart of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make the way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. The title tonight is this, and it's a question. What is your foundation for parenting? What is your foundation for parenting? Let's pray together. Father, we look to you now. Lord, you are our rock. Lord, we cannot stand except we stand on the rock. I pray you'd help us that we would recognize sooner rather than later that you're the key to all that we want to see in our homes. That honoring you and lifting you up, and I pray you tonight, open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of thy law. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the longer I'm in the ministry and the longer that I'm saved, I'm critically aware more and more of the need for every Christian, every born-again Christian, to be in the Word of God 365 days a year. This is our meat. This is our food spiritually. And you are weak as a Christian. The devil's smiling and, and, and rubbing his hands together like this and excited if he sees you out of the Word of God and prayer. Uh, Even some of you have come to me and told me how that uh, you have fallen in love with the Bible now. And and just maybe recently you could have taken or leave it, but boy, it's coming alive to you. Praise God for that. Don't ever let it get dull again. The Bible's not dull. It's we that are dull many times. But boy, by the quickening power of the Holy Spirit, the Bible comes alive. The author sits down beside you and teaches and helps you. Oh, what a privilege. 
And sometimes we get this idea, well, it's okay for pastors and, and probably missionaries ought to be in the Bible. And, and maybe even parents if they have a really bad kid, you know. But children need to be in the Bible every day? Yeah, children. It's interesting in our country, they passed the old deluder Satan Act or something about to that back in Massachusetts. I think it was 1665, something like that. I mean, years ago. You know what it was? To get Bibles to everybody, to teach them how to read so they could read the Bible because they found if they didn't read the Bible, Satan got the advantage in their life. Well, that's pretty amazing. The girls were gone for a couple of days, and so Mary and I were playing with Chloe a little bit, and uh, she was the school teacher. We were the students. And um, so we had different work. Well, Mary, she was supposed to read in the old McGuffey readers. Remember the old McGuffey readers? I think it's on there, 18 something. They, they were proved by Congress in 18 whatever it was to be read in the public schools and printed by them. And in there, it talks about how God made you and, and all these type of things. I'd like to hold that up in Congress to some of these people that talk about how foolish we are and say, hey, guess what? You all, you all used to believe this. The United States government made this happen. We're not the one that's changed. You're all the one that's changed. Boy, I wish someone would bring that type of thing up, don't you? But, uh, but think about it. We used to have some sense and some wisdom because people knew God in our country. And we knew they need to be in the Bible. We may not fully get this, but I can tell you in your home, I believe one of the most critical keys that can by itself, get this, by itself, this one thing by itself virtually guarantee that your children will turn out right. Can you imagine this thought for a minute? Them, you put your child's name in there, them alone with God, one-on-one, -on -one, every day. Can you imagine that? There are some people that want to be an apprentice with someone. There are certain ones that talk about the privilege they had uh, maybe to be under a certain evangelist and travel with them like an apprentice under them. And what a privilege to travel. People used to talk about Joe Boyd or, or different ones like that. And, and man, you'd think, what a privilege. I'd love to have a few minutes alone with whoever to talk. Can you imagine your children from an early age getting alone with God, just God and them every day? Come in his presence. Now that has to be taught how to do that. And that's what in the family altar is an opportunity to do that. And early in their age, uh, you, can talk, you, you can do that. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But this one thing is so critical. We need to realize that the secret of training our children to turn out right is to train them to live a genuine, godly, spiritual Christian life. And that is impossible apart from the Word of God. And so this is the key. And, and notice in verse 8, he says, day and night. But I shall meditate therein day and night. That's interesting. I, I believe Joshua 1 8 is a blanket principle for all time, for all believers, all that name the name of God that he sets forth in the Bible right here for adults, children alike. Look, in, in K5, start them in the morning just with one verse. Well, as soon as they can read, you know why you're learning to read? Gosh, so I can read the Bearstein Bears. You might enjoy the Bearstein Bears, and I like the Bearstein Bears. But you learn to read so you can read God's Word for yourself. You ought to teach them that way. That, that's the reason you're learning to read. Now, all the other things would be a blessing, but the reason is so you can read God's Word for yourself. So God can speak to you. And so as soon as they can read, hey, start them in, in 1 John, just one verse in the morning and one verse at night. It'll be painstaking at first. You have to sit with them and help them. Before long, they can read that one verse and, and uh, maybe go a little further, maybe a little bit down the road a year, maybe now three verses in the morning, three verses at night, just, just by themselves. That, now they can read by themselves that much, teach them how to mark it. And then by the time they get to third grade, they ought to be reading, able to read a chapter in the morning, a chapter at night. And by the time they get to, you know, sixth grade, somewhere in there, two chapters in the morning, two chapters at night. Hey, they'll read through the Bible every year if they do that. Four chapters a day will get you through the Bible in a year, 1,189 chapters. And so what an awesome opportunity in the home. I should be honest, I grew up in a good home, but I didn't read the Bible through until I was a senior in high school. I've talked to people here recently that are old enough to be my mom or dad that say, on oh, my bucket list, they're Christians. They claim to be born again. On oh, my bucket list is to read the Bible all the way through. Well, what a shame that years and years now they haven't read the Bible. How can I live by God's Word, and how can I honestly claim to believe it if I've not read it? And so to change their life from the early get-go, 
to get them in the Word of God every day. You say, well, we read as a family. Good, and you ought to. But this is teaching them their private, personal, just them and God time and how to do it. Now, you have to check up on it, and you have to monitor it, especially early on. And, uh, and you still, all the way through, hey, you, you, young people, you ought to welcome accountability, even in college, uh, even as a young adult. Hey, well, you've been reading the Word recently. How's God speaking to you? That, not, that shouldn't be a scary question. That would be a delightful question. Oh, praise God. Let me tell you what he's been talking to me about, you know. But uh, so to begin them in this, this one thing, honestly, I believe this could be the key, the difference for them to turn out and training them to turn out to live for God, to turn out right. I want you to notice uh, it, 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 the reason to read the word of God. Notice that, verse 8, that thou mayest observe What's the next two words? To do. To do. Not to know, but to do. You say, I want to know it. I do too. But it's not just to know it. Not just get fat on spiritual knowledge, but to do it, to live it. That's the point of doing it day and night that I would observe to do it. That it be fresh in mind. Do you think our God is big enough to help you just happen to read the passage that you needed for that day and something was going to come up and you need to make a decision and it was, boy, I just read about this and God said this is the right way to go. Our God's big enough to do that. I'm amazed at times when some of the uh, songs that are sung that, are, uh, that happen to be the congregational ones or the choir song or, or, or even what was read tonight by these men talking about dad reading in the word of God and stuff. I didn't plan that, but how God puts it together with things. And some people might think, wow, pastor, you're really smart. But I'm not that smart. That's God. Or you might think, well, the song leader, really smart. I, I mean, he's a good guy, but he's not that smart. That's God. And, and that God's big enough to do that in your personal, private time and in your children's. Hey, you think it's possible they could read that morning when sinners entice thee, consent thou not, and they go to school and the kids are trying to get them to do something? And they remember, sinners entice thee, consent thou not, put not your person with them. You know, get out of there, don't go along with them. And they say, I'm going to obey God. See, this, this is the key. This is stronger than your words, stronger than you challenging them to do things. It's the Word of God, and God by His Spirit can bring it to mind at that moment. He cannot bring up what you don't put in. The Hasses uh, have a good illustration about this, talking about going on a trip, and you put things in your suitcase, and anything in your suitcase you can pull out, but if it's not in your suitcase, you can't pull it out. Well, memorizing Scripture and reading God's Word and getting in your heart is like putting in your suitcase. And anything in your suitcase, God can pull out at any time and help you when those darts are flying, when the devil's after you and temptation's coming. And so that's the point of doing it day and night. Now, turn with me to Psalm 1. 400 years later, you can leave Joshua, we're done there. Turn to Psalm chapter 1. 400 years later, God used another mighty man. I love him, the, the, uh, uh, King David, uh, the sweet psalmist of Israel, to write this psalm. In Psalm 1, many of you have memorized it. The Bible says in verse 1, blessed... I want your children to be blessed. Some people say, that means happy. I'm fine with that, happy. I believe it's more than just happy. But blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate. Notice again, day and night. Day and night. By the way, chapter two or Psalm 2, verse 1, has the word imagine in it. That would be a very close word to the word meditate. Imaginations. Something's playing on in your head, you know. Uh, I try not to do this to people because I don't like to scare them, so I try to give them. If it, but if I know I want to talk to one of the staff tomorrow, and I say, hey, I want to speak to you in my office tomorrow morning, you know what's going to happen? Yeah. All night they're thinking, <laughs> you know, what is that? It's an imagination playing, you know. And it'll play. And so if it's not something, if it's something serious, sometimes I don't give them that warning so that for their sake. But if it's not, oh, it's something good. I just want to talk to you about whatever. And so I ease their mind, right? And, and, but, but it's something's playing in there. Or someone really upsets you and you go home and I cannot believe that person. And you're thinking all the scenarios, the different ways you could have handled that. Man, if I'd have thought of saying that, I'd have said that. That would have been so good. You know, and these things are playing in your mind. That's a similar idea here of meditate. All right. Uh, verse 3. Uh, well, let me give you something about verse 1 and 2. Verse 1 is the get out of the world verse. 
Blessed is the man that walketh not and accounts the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Meaning, I don't walk with fools. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Get away from them. Get out of the world. Verse 2 is get into the word verse. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Well, what will that do? Verse 3, and he should be like a tree, planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. See how that's connected to Joshua 1.8? He says about success in Joshua 1.8. Here he says, whatever they do, you shall prosper. There he says, then you'll have good success. Here he says, whatever you do shall prosper. Do you want that for your child? Yes. Every parent here, 100%, yes. What's the key to that? The Word of God. Get them the Word of God. Notice how meditating affects and influences people. When he says, if we'll meditate day and night, what will happen? You'll be like a tree. Meditate in the Word of God day and night, you'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth his fruit and his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. He say, well, give me an example of that. I'll tell you, give you an example of that. Joseph. Joseph was an example of that. Uh, Joseph in, in, in Genesis there. Boy, wherever he, whatever was in his hand prospered. Potiphar recognized that, a lost man. But he said, man, whatever I give him, whatever's in his hand goes up. So he put everything into his hand. The, the jailer then, after he was lied about and put in prison, uh, the jailer noticed that. So everything he put under his hand. And so why was that? I believe this same reason. Joseph, all those years, the reason he get bitter, the reason he didn't get angry at God and uh, accuse God foolishly, the reason was he was clinging to the Word of God. God had given him some dreams, remember? Told him what he was going to make him, and his brothers and father would bow down to him. And so he was believing the Word of God and staying faithful, knowing God was going to do a work. And God did do a work. And what happened? He's like a tree. He was stable even when things got bad. He wasn't running around, I can't believe I'm in jail. This is so stupid. No, he wasn't that way. He was stable still, like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And guess what? He was still flourishing and fruitful even in prison. And not only that, you know what that fruitful tree does? It's a blessing to everybody around it. Man, I got deer in my yard. I'm in, I'm in town. In the subdivision, I got deer in my yard almost every night. You know why? It's a couple of crab apple trees. And they know they're falling on the ground. You know, so they know. Uh, uh, they're, they're there, man. They're eating. I don't know how they know. They can smell it, I guess. But they'll be sitting there, and they're getting pretty friendly. They just kind of look at us as we get out of our car, and we're not that far from them. You know, about from here to Chloe, you know, and they're going to look and they go back to eating, you know, until something finally spooks them. But, but uh, why? It's a blessing to them. Boy, they know where that food is. And it's a blessing to everyone. Joseph was a blessing to everybody around him. Everybody there in Egypt loved Joseph because there was food when famine came. Everybody that didn't live in Egypt came to Egypt to get food. It was a blessing to everybody else because of the Word of God and his attention to God's Word. And so, same will be for me, and same will be for you, and same will be for your children as we model this. So, Christian parents, we must model this age-old practice, this Bible promise back from Joshua's day and, and David's day. You cannot lead your children down a path where you've not gone. They need to see you in the Word. They need to see you meditating on it and quoting it and having it on your heart. It'll revolutionize your life. They'll see that. And it will revolutionize then their life as well as they learn to do it. Turn another place, Psalm 119. Look there, Psalm 119. Psalm 119, if you would, in verse number 1. The Bible says, Psalm 119, verse 1, Blessed, blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. Notice that. Who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies. Again, talking about the word of God. And that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Uh, I like to call this, this is God's preventative principle. Uh, people are talking about vaccines all the time, so let me throw that at you. It's a vaccine for sin. It doesn't mean they'll be sinless. No one is. But notice what it says there. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord, this book. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. And what will be the result? Verse 3. They also do no iniquity. They walk 
in His ways. You know, when you're walking in God's ways and doing right, you're not doing wrong. That's such a blessing, right? But the plowman talked a lot about that. If we'll do what's right, if we'll get a hold of the yeses in life, yes to the Lord, yes to what's right, the no's begin to take care of themselves. The Holy Spirit of God will help us to know what to say no to. And, oh, that's not a right path. I'm walking in His ways because the Word of God will help me to recognize what's right. That's God's promise there. They also do no iniquity. They walk in His ways. Notice verse 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Now listen, I believe that is speaking of memorization, but I don't believe it's just memorization. I can't quote every verse just right that I want to. I don't have some verses I never memorized, but I've just so frequently used them that they've become a part of me. And, And some of that is just from, by reason of use, just from being in the Word. Notice, thy word have I hid in my heart. It doesn't say just wrote memorization. But it's become a part of me. I've, I've brought in my heart. I've let uh, the, the washing of the water of the word on my life. And thy word have I hid in my heart. That I might not sin against thee. And so there's a direct correlation from the word of God to sinning. And so if there's not the word of God in my heart, I'll sin against God more. It's a direct relationship there. Look at verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto, according to thy word. Now, I don't believe that's just the one that's fallen in sin, although it is. I'm glad in prisons they often have a Bible there where prisoners can read. Because I believe a young man can cleanse his way by taking heed according to his word. But I believe also the way we're on be a clean way if I take heed according to his word. I don't have to have messed up first to get my way cleansed, but the way I'm on, the way I'm headed will be clean. It will be right if I've taken heed there to according to thy word. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed there to according to thy word. Boy, I want my way to be clean. Though I want, oh boy, I want my children's ways to be clean. How can I help them to have a clean way to walk? By helping them take heed according to his word. Christian parents somehow have gotten the idea that the Bible's too boring for children. It's too boring for them to read. And in our finite wisdom, we've tried to come up with some better idea. But God's Word still says that we're to meditate on, we're to read on, we're to study. Is it plausible to think that God in His infinite wisdom might have a simpler and better solution? I mean, in in God's Word, repeatedly, He admonishes all His people to study to show themselves approved unto God. There's no age limit on that. Once you turn 21, study to show... No, no. If you're God's child, study to show thyself approved unto God. He says, give attendance to reading. He's talking about reading the Word of God. The Bible says to meditate in His Word day and night. We've looked at several passages about that. What is your foundation for parenting? I believe one reason there's been such a decline in Christian young people is we've forgotten this age-old God-given principle. So simple! It's so profound. And God said it. This is what it will result in as we get in the Word. If you follow the biblical pattern and make the Bible the foundation, then your parenting will be, and I'm going to give you two points. Now hear me out on the first one, all right? Number one, your parenting will be negative. Now remember when I said, when we started this study, I'm not interested in being politically correct. I'm not interested in being culturally correct. I'm interested in being biblically correct. I'm fully aware of what the world says. Oh, never correct them. Oh, let them self-express. You're going to damage their little psyche. Well, my dad was not worried about damaging my little psyche. And you all are grateful for that. Again, friend, that's a lie. That's bad counsel. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. God's right, and the world's wrong. Now, don't misunderstand me. I preached last week, right, about positive. I got there on positive reinforcement, and that positive reinforcement, that first one is love. And boy, spending time with them and and training them. You can't correct someone until you first train them how to correctly do this or that or how to correctly handle this or that. But then guess what? There is correction needed. 
There also must be lots and lots of correction along with lots and lots of love. Uh, turn with me to two places in Proverbs real quick. Look at Proverbs 29. We're going to finish in Proverbs here. Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29, verse 15. Now again, I, like I said, my, my desire is not to please the world and what, what I'm trying to give you, but to help you from the God's Word and to please the Lord and be biblically correct. Proverbs 29, verse 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Well, the rod and the proof speak of correction. You, you've taught him, my son, give the heart, listen to my ways, hear, hearken, we, we preached all that. But when he's not, now the rod and the proof are going to give some wisdom. But if you don't do it, a child left to himself brings his mother to shame. Look at verse 17. What's the first word of verse 17? Oh, don't ever correct little Johnny. That's not what God says. Correct thy son! Eli lost his life and his two boys lost their lives because he did not correct them. I gave you that this morning. He says, correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. How do I get that? By correcting him. It's unbelievable to me. And I'm not into physically, uh, you know, just overpowering people. But it is amazing when you have people that, you know, big guys... I mean, bigger than me, several hundred pound guys, big guys. And they have this child that's three. I don't know what to do with them. I mean, we had one recently here at the church. They were here in an interview, and it was a first grade interview. But a kid running around, he's pressing the doorbell outside because he couldn't stay in the office during the interview. And we couldn't accept him. He couldn't even sit still. He hit his mom several, his grandma several times during the interview. But his dad, mom wasn't there, but his dad, big guy, big this way, big this way. He takes him outside, so one of our teachers go and say, oh, they're having an interview in there, and he keeps ringing the doorbell. And he said, yeah, we were in the interview, but we had to come out because he wouldn't behave. And so he's kind of like, nothing I can do. Nothing you can do? Are you kidding me? So this boy's got you at first grade, you can't, nothing you can do about it? But that's this world we live in. I, kid flailing around, or here's people having a funeral or something, and people, kids fly, oh, you know, and parents are like, Boy, if you get to this word, God has answers for you. Yes. Correct thy son. There also must be lots and lots of correction with your lots and lots of love. So, number one, it is negative. Negative. Now, after training, go to Proverbs 4. Proverbs chapter 4. This is where we get this point from. Proverbs chapter 4. I had to give that kind of disqualification just for some of you so you wouldn't nail me to the wall later about it. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 4, look at verse 1. After training, we must have the negative, meaning the correction. Look at Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1. Hear ye children, here, here's the training. Hear ye children, the instruction of a father. So he's training. Let me give you some instruction. And attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, good teaching, good belief, good teaching here. Forsake ye not my law, for I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments and live. Now is that correction or is it training? It's training. He's not correcting on anything. He's just saying, let me give you some good instruction. I got this from my dad. His dad was David. And said, let me help you now with this great instruction. If you'll keep these commandments, you'll live. God will bless your life. All right. Now the end of the chapter. Look at verse 23. So he's trained him. He's given him instruction. Now verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. Still training. Now verse 24. Put away from thee a froward mouth. And perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on. Let thine eyelids look, eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet. Let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor the left. Remove thy foot from evil. He starts to correct them. Hey, put away this. Put far this. Turn not that way. Remove your foot from that. Look, children need to know the boundaries. He's setting up some boundaries here. Children need to know you're going to call them out on the boundaries. These boundaries are solid. They're not movable. They're secure. And by the way, that brings such security and stability to children to know where the boundaries are. 
It's interesting with some animals, if you put them in too large of a pen, they're nervous about that. That's a problem for them. They have to be in a certain size. It's interesting, you start studying agricultural. They don't like to be in a too big of a place. They need the this, this stability of a, of a certain size. That's interesting. Well, you know what? Children need the stability of rules and know where the walls are. Now, they're going to push against them just like an animal pushes on the fence. But, but they need to know that they're saw that they're not going to move. And so set up training times. Set up training times. Uh, this is so good and so helpful. You know, um, if, and again, I don't want to, I know it's kind of crass, but just, just bear with me. Just like you would, if you're going to train your dog to roll over, if you're going to train your dog to shake, if you're going to train your dog to sit, you're going to work with the dog. You're not coming in, that dog's doing something, you start spanking him, you know, and what are you doing, you know, now do this. No, you haven't even taught him the trick, but you're going to start teaching, you're going to work with them. So when your children are small, two or three, come on, Ryan. <laughs> That's for acting up last time. So come on up here. So your children are small. And you say, all right, now listen here. You don't touch this. This is daddy's phone. You don't touch that, all right? You sit on a table in the living room, maybe. And you, you walk away. I said, now, now listen. Remember what I said, you don't touch this. You understand that? What did I say? Don't, don't touch that. Yeah. She's just like a two-year-old, you know. He could say, <laughs> don't touch that, you know. Wasn't that cute? And so, and so then, then I'm serious. Then walk out. Walk out of the room. And, you know, two-year-olds, they're not real sharp, you know. That's why I picked, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, and so you then peek around the corner and look and see what they do. Hey, if they do right, come in. Good boy, good boy, you didn't touch that. I didn't touch it. Yeah, you didn't. Good job. That's how we obey. Good. Yeah. And spend time training. All right. Now, now over here, notice this. This is mama's whatever. Now, we don't touch that. You understand? You don't touch that. Now, what did I say? Yeah, it's good to do that. By the way, it works well for married couples, by the way. It's called drive-through communication, you know. Big Mac fries. Did you say Big Mac fries? Yeah, that's what I said. Good. You know, so with kids, it works good, too. Now, did you hear what I said? Yeah, you know, especially when you have teenagers, I'm telling you. And so, and so, don't touch it. And you, you know, you're, you're working with them. So you go out of the room, out of sight. They think it's free. And watch them. See what they do. Praise them if they do wrong. If they do, if, praise them if they do right. If they do wrong, then like we taught last Sunday, discipline, spank them. Hey, it'll pay dividends when it is grandma's china. Or a rattlesnake. Brother Wayne sent me a picture yesterday. On a path there, they were out to bike, and I think it was Laura Best bike that was in the picture. Here's a big, big rattlesnake. And he told her, stop and stop. And he said, it was a good teaching moment about, and this time it really was a rattlesnake, and they obeyed. And good thing, too, because it could have cost them their life. You know? But you have to train that. You have to work at that. So start when they're two and three. Start, you know, don't, not when they're correcting. You go to someone's house, they're grabbing everything. Don't do that. What are you doing? Quit doing that. Well, how's a child to know that? Every place he's ever been, he can do whatever. At home, you've locked everything up you've caught, where he can't get into anything that they're not supposed to, and only his toys are out. He's allowed to touch everything. How's he to know that grandma is not supposed to touch all these things or, or at the friend's house, right? The only way is you to train them. This is what you can play. This is a toy. We can play with that. And then nothing else you're here to touch. And they've learned to obey that. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it. Yeah. Last time I got preaching, he was up here, and I guess he was touching stuff and doing things. I didn't even pay attention. Some of you caught it. Some of you maybe didn't. I was told about it later. But uh, anyway, and so train them. Work with it. It takes time, but it's worth that. And, uh, and don't touch this. And uh, then and, and train them and practice with them. Also practice them having them sit in your lap. Ernesto, you come up with Esther. Esther's in here again. She sits so well in church. I'm so proud of her. Come on up here. Now, this is, this is important. How many of you know there's going to be times with your children you're going to have need to them to sit in your lap and they can't move? How many of you know that? Yeah, absolutely. There's times for that. There's places that you're going to need to sit down with them. So guess what? Practice that at home. Not just when they're watching TV or something they want to watch. But where it's time for them to sit and you don't have to, you know, are up and down and flipping around. You're trying to like this. But, but sitting. She's not fighting. Put your hand in And she could sit there. Now you have to work with them with that. Now, when they're small and they want to fight, you can make a child, you're strong enough, you can make a child sit there. Daddy said you're going to sit still. Now sit still. And I can hold them. Because I may not be in a place I can spank them right then. 
And so I'm going to make them sit, and they're going to learn. And then later they're going to get in trouble for that. But with them, it's small. You need to do that at home, where he can sit and, and he could move your hands. So he can do something else, and she'll sit there, and she'll just run off. Train them to sit. Not only that, have her sit beside you. Yeah. There, guess what? You're gonna, Mom, you're going to go to the dentist, or Dad, you're going to go to the dentist. And now you've got to get in the chair. And they can't work at you, and you have to hold your kid. Now your kid's starting to run, and they, they don't, I don't know that. You know, they need to learn that they've got to sit in the chair. And they can do that. But you have to work with them, train them to do that. We've talked about that. I'm telling you, it'll open up witnessing opportunities for you. People are like, how does your child just sit? They must be just an just a angel of a kid. Well, actually, no. <laughs> there are no angels of kids. If you had kids, you know that. Actually, we've followed the Word of God. And you know, if you'll teach them and train them, they, any child can learn to sit like this. Now, it's harder for some than others. I get it. That's why I got more spankings than my whole family put together. That's what my parents would tell you. The rest of the five put together, I got more. Because I was, I'm sure they would have told me I was ADD or something. But, boy, get enough spanking, even an ADD guy can learn, right? Or whatever, you know? And, and, uh, and, and you, I could. I learned to sit, sure enough, right? And, and, and kids can learn. And it'll open up witness opportunities. People say, boy, I wish my kids were like that. It can be. God's Word will teach you how to do that. And what an opportunity. The Lord has made His people to be a bright, shining light different than the world. And what a privilege to have a home where you could say, all right, sit down, we're going to read the Bible. You don't have to be chasing them around. And, I said sit down. You can't even read the Bible because everyone's just crazy. But you can say, no, we're going to sit now. And see, there's a good plan, training time right there. That might be the time you have to work with them for a little while when they're small. No, we're gonna, I guess, when they're small, real small, you might have them sit with mom or, or you hold them and, and the mama reads the Bible because they can't read you. And we're going to learn to sit when it's time to sit. And there's times they need to do that. In a restaurant, on an airplane, whatever, right? All right, you did so good. Good job. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, so um, training them and uh, talking with them, it'll open up amazing witness opportunities uh, at doctor's office, at the DMV. You've got to wait a long time there, right? Etc. <laughs> number one, negative. Number two, and I'm done, never ending. The Word of God, think of it. This, the Word of God, the training here in the home, it needs to be negative, but also it, the, uh, your parenting, if you're going to follow the biblical pattern, it'll be negative, but also it'll be never ending. Look at Proverbs 6. I love Proverbs 6 and verse 20 through 23. Look here. 20 to 23. My son... Keep thy father's commandments, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart, and tie them about thy neck. And look at verse 22. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou wakest, it shall talk with thee. This is amazing to me. You know, my grandpa has been in heaven for 15 years. He died in his 80s, World War II vet. But you, you know that there's things that I'm doing sometimes I can still hear my grandpa's voice saying things like, measure twice, cut once. That's a good thing to hear. Measure twice, cut once, right? Uh, things like, do it right the first time. As boys, we always wanted to throw rocks. So if there's ever loose rocks somewhere, we'd want to be throwing them. And, and if it was something that they were put there on purpose, someone put those there. They wanted him to be there, whether it was, you know, by a shoreline or whatever. We want to throw rocks in. And he taught us to care for other people's things. He's very conscientious about other people's property. I'll never forget as a young man, uh, we stayed somewhere. Uh, I forget where. My dad preached somewhere, and then we were going fishing, and my grandpa was with us. And, and, and I was, I don't know, 12, 13, 14. It, I had to be pretty old because I wouldn't have done this when I was younger. But that night or that morning, for whatever reason, I got a shower. You know, when I was young, I'd have been like, not even thought about a shower without mom there, right? But, uh, but that age I did, and, and my grandpa and I come out. He said, what are you doing? He said, We're, this is people let us stay here, and, and you're going to get their shower all dirty and messed up and, and t- towels and such. He said, we're going in the woods for four days. You don't need a shower, you know? He said, we're all going to stink by the time we get out there, you know? He just, he got on to me. But he was, he was serious about it. Now, I know you might think, what? Think of someone went through the Great Depression, 
Thank you, someone uh, that went through World War II. This is a great generation and about saving. Even to this day, if I shower at my grandma's house in their basement, I've got to wipe it down a certain way or she has to come down and do it. She's 95 years old, you know, can't see. But they have a certain way about it, and, and that's okay. You understand that. Um, but but uh, I'll never forget that. And, and the, the towels you got, and, and just he was so conscientious about other people's things. You think about young people today, they don't care a thing about anybody's stuff. They come over the church here and do damage and things, and we try to, you know, it's unbelievable. But that generation was so conscientious, and I can still hear him talking to me. That's what he says in verse 22. I, I could share things about my dad and my mom, though they live a thousand miles away. I can hear them at times. Notice in verse 22, when thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. When thou wakest, it shall talk with thee. The first part, when thou goest, it shall lead thee. There's times in life I'm thinking, what should I do? And I, it comes to my mind, I know what my dad would do. I know what mom would do. Well, that's a, if, they have godly, if you have godly parents, that's a great thing to draw on. I know what they would do. Not only that, when you sleep, it'll keep thee. Oh, think of the peace that is, comes to children when they do right. When you followed your parents' counsel. Look at verse, the end of the verse. When thou wakest, it shall talk with thee. I've already talked about that. But some of you could talk about that. You hear them. You can still hear their voice saying certain things. And there are things that have st- stuck with you. Now, I want you to notice something else here. Verse 23. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of cr- instructions are the way of life. This instruction you're going to give your children will be never-ending. You say, how do you know that? Well, I want you to look at, well, verse 22, I've already explained that. But look at verse 20. In verse 20, he says, my son, keep thy father's commandment. I've drawn a circle around commandment, and I've connected it with commandment in verse 23. And forsake not the law of thy mother. I've drawn a circle around the word law and connected that with the word law in verse 23. You notice what he says there? He's still talking about the same subject. My son, keep thy father's commandment. Forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart. Tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. When thou wakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment. What commandment? The one in verse 20. The commandment is a lamp. And the law. What law? The one in verse 20. Is light. And reproofs of instruction are the way of life. You know what the Bible is saying? Both of these two things, the commandment and the law, what are they? They're light. They give light. They're going to give light. What does light do? Light guides. You know what light does? Light shows where to go. Aren't you glad for headlights at night when you drive home, it's dark? Light shows where to go. The light shows where not to go. Light reveals. And these things that we're teaching them... What do I do here? Children are going to come upon things. What do I, what's right to do? And this will give light to them to know what's right to do. The question is, Dad, Mom, are you giving your children light to see, light to navigate this dark world? Look, not just what you think. I, my dad didn't just teach me the Bowman way, or my grandpa didn't just teach me the Bowman way, or my mom the matern way, but God's way. The Bible way. Not just what you think, but teaching them the Bible. Teaching them Bible principles to live by. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 1. My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live. And my law is the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers. Write them upon the table of thine heart. You know what he's saying? These are things worth keeping. Verse 1, keep. Verse 2, he says, these things are precious. Keep them as the apple of thine eye. And then verse 3, these things are permanent. These things are for life. Write them on the table of thine heart. These things will help you all your life long. Friday, I was at one of the most precious funerals I've ever been at in my whole life. I mean that. It was beautiful. It was so honoring to God. And what a family that God gave a man that was faithful and honored the Lord with his life. You think about that. He gave his life to God. I honestly, I turned to my girls before we left the parking lot. My girls can test this. I turned to them and I said to them, you don't have a funeral like that unless you live your life for God. 
I couldn't get it out in one sentence because I broke down in tears. But I'm telling you, that's the truth. I said, you look at lost people. You look at their, at their... I've been to a lot of funerals. I don't enjoy funerals. But you don't see that type of thing very often. Grandkids getting up singing uh, all together. I'm on the winning side. You know, uh, the, the kids saying things that are just uh, honoring to the Lord and to their father because he knew the Lord, what it meant. And pastors saying things, how, oh, what, it, what a blessing it was for all these years to have this deacon that was faithful. And he said amen in church. What a courage that was when, when, when sometimes I'd get struggling in, in the ministry. He was, we're with you, pastor, and we're, we're here to help you. And, and I, I, he, he, the, that pastor said he felt like the ministry was just as much his life as it was mine as the pastor. And just all of that. Uh, this wasn't a pastor. This wasn't someone in ministry. But this was someone that served God with his life. Now, he has children in ministry and grandchildren in ministry. Some of them are here. But you don't get that at the end if you don't live your life for God. I don't know if I can quantify it, honestly, what a legacy that was left behind. But parents, young people here today, can I plead with you? You do not, I fear none of us, fully understand what you are giving your children if you're faithful to God. I don't think any of us fully understand what you are really giving your children if you're faithful to God and faithful to church and faithful to raise your children for God and live a truly Christian life. I don't think we fully understand what we're, the gift that we're really giving them when we do that. But I want to say it on the other side. At the same time, listen, you don't fully understand, I don't believe, what you're losing if you don't. What you're giving up. What you're losing in their life and the next generation's life by not living for God. Living faithful. Living a testimony that you'd want them to follow. If you don't live for God with all your heart, if you don't raise your children for God, if you don't discipline them and nourish them, as I talked this morning, and raise them in the Word of God, do we understand what we're giving up if we don't obey the Word of God in this? What's your foundation in parenting? Will you bow your head with me?